listening to The Writing Life, interviewing real writers about making a living from their words. Hi, we are The Writing Life. I'm Ines. I'm here with Kitty. Hi. And today we have the successful writer, Kirsty Logan, author of The Grace Keepers. So now, Kirsty, if you'd like to read some of your work for us. I would love to. Thank you very much for having me. So I'm going to read you a little bit from The Grace Keepers, which is my first novel. And in short, The Grace Keepers is about a circus boat in a flooded world. So I'm going to read you a little bit to introduce you to this world of the circus. And it will be from the point of view of North, who is one of our two main characters. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of North and then after that, I'll give you a little bit of the other main character who I'll introduce. Um, So here's a little bit from quite near the beginning of The Grace Keepers. The last act before the interval was North's favorite, Melia and Whitby. Tonight they were aerialists, their ropes strung up high between the Excalibur's two masts. They began on the ground, their turquoise hair and silver bodysuits rendering them mirror images. In the centre of the stage hung a pair of long ropes. As the music began, the acrobats wrapped a rope around their wrists and began to roll up it in a series of planches, their bodies rolling, their delicate legs pointed like compass needles. Higher and higher they climbed, tilting the crowd's heads further and further. At the highest point of the big top, they spiralled off and landed neatly on a tiny platform strung with ropes. The spotlight was trained only on them, leaving the rest in darkness. For a moment they were lost in an explosion of white as they smacked chalk between their palms, letting the excess drift down into darkness. Wrapping his wrists and ankles in ropes, Whitby bent his body into a crescent moon. Melia dropped from the platform and hung from the curve of his body for two breaths before letting go, falling to the ground like a comet. At the last moment, she hooked her arm into a loop of rope, muscles pulsing. The crowd let out a smudge of noise, a mix of screams, gasps, moans. She began to sway her body, building up momentum, letting her weight widen the circle until she was swinging a circuit around the entire big top, far above the tilted heads of the crowd. Even from behind curtains, North could see the incredible strain on Melia's arms. She shifted position to get a better hold, and North let out an oh as Melia seemed to lose her grip. She fell two body lengths on the rope, unable to hold it, and there was no net, and there was no safety line, and there was not enough time for anyone to run out and catch her. North screwed her eyes shut. But there was no scream, no thud of a fallen body. North looked up to see Whitby, Knees wrapped in the rope, arms spread, holding Melia's wrists. Their smiles stretched wide. They were not siblings or spouses as they pretended. They were two halves of the same whole. Not everyone found the key to their lock, the answer to their question. But they had. They took their bows high above the crowd, letting the applause float up like birds. Uh, So that was just introducing you to the world of the circus there. And North is a bear girl in the circus, so she dances with a bear in the circus. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. So now we'll go straight into the questions. Yes. So you published your first novel, The Grace Keepers, which we've just heard a bit from. um, And you did that this year. So how does it feel? Surreal. (laughs) quite surreal. I've been asked a lot recently, what does it feel like to write your debut novel? But I think the thing is, while you're writing it, you don't know that it's your debut novel. So I had written novels before this, which were, quite frankly, not very good. And so when I was writing this one, I I wasn't aware of any of the things that would happen. I wasn't aware that it would mean I could be a full-time writer or that I would be traveling all around doing events and things. As far as I knew, it was just another attempt at something that I hadn't quite managed to do before. So it's 
it's been quite surreal. I, I think it's really important, though, to not really think about what's going to happen after the book comes out, because I think if I had known, I would have just been so crippled with insecurity <laughs> that I wouldn't have been able to write anything at all. I think while, while we write, we have to fool ourselves that nobody will ever read it. Otherwise, it's quite horrifying to write anything. Did you have an, an, an agent for this novel before you published it or...? I did, yes. The novel started actually uh, quite a long time ago as a short story and it came from a very personal place. I wrote it quite soon after my father died and he died very suddenly uh, when I was 27. He was young as well, he was only 58 and it, this was a whole new experience for me. I had never known grief like this before and I was trying to find my way through that experience and About a year after he died, I happened to be out on a boat and I saw a life boy that was a, a light in a cage. And I was just daydreaming and I thought, oh, I wonder why he would have a, a bird cage because it looked like a bird cage to me. I thought, why would you have a bird cage at sea? And because grief was, was on my mind very much still, I just had this idea for the, the boy being a grave marker. And I wrote a story based on that, which was in my first book, which is a short story collection called The Rental Heart. Mm -hmm. And as far as I was concerned, it was finished. Um, I had said what I wanted to say in the story. But then a few years later, when I sat down to write this novel, which was about this circus boat, something about this idea of, of the grace keeper and of this world where the birds were, were marking graves just came back to me and funnily enough you know that became the title and it became the whole thing that held it together but initially um, it was going to be about something completely different it was about just the circus element and it didn't have the the grace keeper element at all so mm -hmm. it all came together quite quite piecemeal I think. Mm -hmm. So in, what, in which way did you contact your agent? Did you contact the agent first or...? Uh, well, I had a very, like most writers, I had a very back and forth, kind of one step forward, two steps back <laughs> experience, which seems quite common. So years ago, before I, I had a completed novel, mm. I got to know an agent actually through Twitter, because someone that I knew on Twitter had a friend who was an agent. And luckily for me, this guy that I knew really liked my writing, and he recommended me to his agent friend. So she got in touch with me. And I ended up around the same time, another thing on Twitter, by the way, if you're not on Twitter as a writer, get on Twitter. Um, I had seen a contest advertised on Twitter that had a prize of going down to London to meet with an author, an editor and an agent. And I was one of the winners. So I went down to London and I really got on with the agent. I really, really liked her. And I stayed in touch with her. Even though I didn't have a novel, I just sort of emailed her and said, hello, nice to meet you. Maybe when I have a novel, I could send you it. And she said, yep, that would be great. So it just happened that I had kind of got in touch with these two agents separately. And then, amazingly enough, they both were interested. And I went with, with one of them. And unfortunately, a little while later, she decided she didn't want to be an agent anymore. Um, although, funnily enough, she now works at my publisher. So <laughs> always be polite because you never know when you're going to bump into people again. <laughs> um, so unfortunately, I then had to kind of crawl back to the um, other agent who I had said no to and say, oh, do you remember me? Are you still interested? <laughs> and then because she's wonderful and very big hearted, she said, yes, of course, I'm still interested. Please send me it. And then she and I had a quite a difficult conversation where she basically said, I think that you're a good writer, but I don't think this is the right novel, uh, which was gutting, obviously, because it had taken me two years to write it. But luckily, I had already begun a new novel, which was called The Grace Keepers. Yeah. And so I sent her the start of that one, And she said, yes, this is the one. Keep going. Um, I want to sign you for this one. So, yeah, that's how it happened. So, again, it was quite, quite back and forth. It wasn't, it wasn't a clear path. Brilliant. So if there are any listeners who are at that stage of trying to find an agent, what would be your main piece of advice for them? My advice is, number one, always be polite and professional. If the agent has guidelines on their website, don't try and not do the guidelines to be quirky and stand out. The guidelines are there for a reason. Although it might be boring to you and take up a lot of your time, just do it because otherwise your manuscript is just going to go straight in the bin. So definitely do what the agent is asking for. I would say also a lot of finding an agent and getting published, in my opinion, is like throwing darts at a dartboard and not knowing which one is going to hit the bullseye. 
But if you only throw one dart, it's not very likely to hit the bullseye, unless you're skilled. I'm not a very skilled darts player. So my, my advice would be just throw as many darts as you can at the board, and one of them will hit. But you just can't know in advance which one it's going to be. So take every opportunity that comes up. Do as much as you can. Network as much as you can. Make friends with other writers. Make friends with other people in the literary world because you just never know which thing is going to lead to something. I had no idea that entering this contest would lead to me getting an agent. And I didn't know that making friends with someone on Twitter would lead to him recommending me to an agent because I had no idea that he had a friend who was an agent. So definitely just always make connections with people. Try and help other people out because then when the time comes, perhaps they will help you too. And you also write shorter stories This, uh, The Rental Heart, you mentioned? Yes, so The Rental Heart is my first short story collection. Um, I also recently published a second short story collection, which is called A Portable Shelter. Uh, so I have, so far, two, two story collections and one novel. And it's interesting because you published The Rental Heart before your novel, mm -hmm. right? And usually aspiring writers are told, like, well, short stories, you know, it's so difficult to publish them. Like, they are sort of discouraged to try with the short stories, but you seem quite successful with them. Uh, yeah, it's been a complete fluke. And um, I'd heard the same wisdom. I'd heard you can't publish a short story collection. So to be honest, I had not tried to put a short story collection together. I had written a lot of short stories. I'd written over a hundred short stories and flash fictions and published many of them. And had them on the radio and things like that. But I hadn't put a collection together just because, you know, conventional wisdom is you can't publish them. And yeah. to a large extent, that's true. I don't mean to to try and give people a false idea of, of the market, but I was lucky that Salt, the publisher of my first collection, used to run a contest, which was called the Scott Prize. Unfortunately, they're not running it anymore, but it was it was great. And the it was for unpublished short story manuscripts so it was for authors who hadn't published a book before and I saw this contest and I thought you know might as well give it a go never thought I would ever win but I thought well I've got enough stories that I could put a collection together so I did I sat down with all my stories and tried to see where there were patterns where there were certain themes that maybe overlapped in different stories and they might come together as a coherent collection and I put that together and entered the contest and tried to just forget about it, really, because I never thought that I would win. And then, yeah, one day it just it won, and that's how that's how that book was published. So, I mean, I, I definitely agree. It's very, very tricky to get a short story collection published. And I should also add that my agent has not sold my short story collections. She focuses on the novels because, yeah, the fact remains people just don't buy as many short story collections. So generally, you'd be incredibly lucky if you manage to get an agent for a short story collection. Unfortunately, even if it's really, really good, an agent is much more likely to want a novel from you. Looking at the creative side, what would you say is the main difference between your writing a short story and the process you went through to write your novel? It's a good question, yeah. I mean, they're incredibly different for me. They're two completely different beasts. And I think the ability to write one doesn't necessarily mean you can write the other. All different types of writing are quite different. So, for example, I don't really write poetry. Um, although I can write a novel and I can write a short story, I don't really think that I have the, the necessary skills to to write high quality poetry so they're very different to me a short story is like looking through a keyhole so they're very small but they hint at or suggest a much larger world or an, and a much larger story so you can't ever have the same huge breadth and depth in a short story as you can in a novel but that's not necessarily a fault I actually really like that about short stories they ask a lot of the reader they really ask the reader to use their imagination and to use their thinking skills to fill in a lot of intentional gaps that are left just like looking through a keyhole you can't necessarily see everything but this through this small space you can see a much bigger world whereas to me a novel I always think of it as more like a doll's house or I always love, you know, when you're at a museum and they have the tiny little dioramas of scenes that to me, that's what a novel is. It's this a huge world 
that you can look at and explore and you know in the in the doll's house you can look at all the different rooms and see all the different stories of what people are doing so it's a very different process of writing it just as I think it's a very different experience of reading it and I think for me writing short stories and writing novels appeal to different parts of my brain you know there's some, one part of my brain that really likes a short sharp vivid shock of a story but then there's also a part of my brain that loves this world of the novel and the fact that you can explore it and it's this huge big made up world that you can then explore and get to know the characters in such depth so they're very different they're very different experiences and I think I learned how to write short stories before I learned to write novels not because I think that's the way you have to do it that's just the way that I did it but they are very different skills. Um, apart from being a writer you also you are also writing mentoring war mm -hmm. mentoring I've never heard of this site but I came across it when I was uh, looking at your web page and I found it really fascinating. So could you tell our listeners about it? Yes, I love this project, uh, the Woman Mentoring Project. I've been doing it for a couple of years now. Really love it. Um, and the way that it works is that writers and editors, journalists, um, all sorts of women in the, the literary arts give up their time and their knowledge uh, for free to help Uh, up-and-coming women writers who wouldn't otherwise be able to access professional mentoring, whether that's for financial reasons or time reasons or geographical reasons, all different types of reasons. So you can go on the website and you can choose a mentor that you think you would like to work with and then you submit an application form and a sample of your writing and this is all free, no fees at any point and then if the mentor chooses you then you work with them and each mentor provides different amounts of mentoring. For me, it's three meetings. So it can either be a face-to-face -face meeting of a couple of hours or it can be on the phone or via email or Skype or anything like that. Um, and I absolutely love it. Initially, I was only supposed to choose one um, mentee, but I had so many amazing applications that I chose three because I just couldn't choose between them. And then I'm on my second round at the moment and I chose two mentees just because they were so good that I couldn't choose between them. And um, I've nearly finished up my sessions with them. So soon I will be open to applications again. So if you think you might like to work with me, then you'll be able to apply through the website. And as I said, it's all completely free and it's for uh, women writers who are perhaps early on in their careers, but are very ambitious and would like to improve, but are perhaps struggling with various aspects. And then I can work with you and try and help you through those things. Yeah, sounds, sounds really fascinating. And what are the main challenges of being a mentor? Oh, good question. I don't find it challenging at all. I find it completely fulfilling and great. I absolutely love it. I think it helps me as a person. It helps me in my creative practice. And also it keeps me on my toes because I see just how much talent is out there. And, you know, the fact that I'm published doesn't mean that I can rest on my laurels. Definitely seeing what everyone else is doing and the sheer quality and determination that's out there. I think it's really would benefit a lot of writers to, to look at what unpublished writers are doing because there's so much talent out there that just needs to be discovered. So I don't I don't find there are any challenges. I just I just absolutely love it. Do you ever find it difficult, though, to balance your writing time with your mentoring time? Do you have a specific writing routine that you try to stick to? <laughs> I do try. <laughs> don't necessarily succeed. Um, I don't find mentoring gets in the way of writing. I find Netflix gets in the way of writing. I'm a terrible procrastinator, really terrible. So I do. I try and write first thing in the morning because I'm really not a morning person. I'm rotten in the mornings. I'm so grumpy and awful. So it's best that I don't speak to anybody first thing in the morning. So I try and just write because then it can just be me and my story, me and my laptop. And my laptop doesn't mind if I'm rude to it. So that's fine. So I try and write first thing in the morning, just with my coffee. I find it's quite helpful as well when I haven't really woken up yet, because then I'm less self-critical so that's what I try and do and then I, I don't have massive goals for my writing I try and do about 400 words a day 
and sometimes I do more, but I find as long as I do my 400 words in the morning, it doesn't matter what happens for the rest of the day. The rest of the day can be a complete write-off. I can just end up doing errands or watching Netflix or doing anything for the rest of the day. But at least I've got those 400 words, so I know at least I've progressed that much. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And coming back to the female and the conception of the female through literature, because, you know, one of the things I really liked about the Grace Keepers was that the female characters were really interesting. And I feel like in literature, this is actually so difficult to find for me as a reader. Like, female characters, I really feel like I, I can't empathize mm. with. I was wondering, how do you write your female characters? Like, do they come across easier than the male ones? They just, it doesn't matter for you? Or? Oh, yeah, so I've never been asked that before. That's an interesting question. I, I don't really think of my characters as male or female in general. Um, actually, a few of the characters in The Grace Keepers and in my other books are gender neutral, so we don't know what gender they are, if they're male or female or somewhere in between on the spectrum. So I don't really think of the characters in that way. I just kind of let them come to me and, you know, sometimes a, a character's gender shifts as I'm writing them, uh, which is fine. I, I think of gender as being quite fluid anyway. But I think, you know, I am a woman and my partner is a woman and I spend most of my time around women. So I think most of my characters are women just because I know women better than I know men, I guess. I'm not averse to writing male characters, but I'm, they just don't come to me as often that way. So thinking about where your ideas come from, do you ever travel to gather inspiration for your novels or do you do research for them? How do you come up with your ideas? Oh, I love traveling for research, absolutely. Before The Grace Keepers, I did a lot of traveling around Scotland. I went on writing retreats, um, a lot of them by the sea, which I guess <laughs> comes across quite clearly. It's a very sea-based book. Um, so definitely being by the sea and the landscape of Scotland really, really inspired the book a lot. And I've actually just been on a, a little holiday to Iceland with my girlfriend. And I found that so inspiring. I love Iceland. I would move there tomorrow if I could. And um, it's really inspired my next book is going to be set in a kind of fantastical version of Iceland. So definitely certain places just absolutely set all the, the inspiration lights in my brain going. Definitely, yeah. Oh, brilliant. We're going to count that as an exclusive for our radio. <laughs> Details of your next novel. Fantastic. Also, another theme I found in the Gracekeepers, like the folklore, the sea, the love for animals, because I think the character of the beard really was well done and came across quite strongly. In which ways are all these things related to yourself? That's a good question. I think most writers can't help but write about certain things. Even when we try and write about other things, we keep circling around and around and around with certain obsessions. And I've, the more that I've written now, the more that I'm seeing that in my own work, certain subjects like home and parents and the difficulty of sustaining love and as you say animals and our relationship with animals and with mm. place and with landscape and with home and what does home mean what does it mean the home that we came from and the home that we make the family that we make um certainly all these things I keep coming back to them and folklore and fairy tales are just a constant obsession even when I try not to write about them They just sneak in somehow. And I'm glad that you like the bear. That was really important to me. And he's never named in the book because um, I didn't want mm. him to seem too cutesy or too safe. And I think the, the way that the bear really came through to me is when, when I first started writing the book and I had the first draft down, he wasn't really coming through. He was too safe and nice and too much of a teddy bear. And it just wasn't quite working. And then my girlfriend and I adopted a rescue dog uh, called Rosie, who we love very much. She's a lovely, gorgeous little dog. But it really just showed me how you can love something so much and it's still a wild animal. And, you know, a dog can love you so much in return, but it's still a dog. It's still an animal. And we try and anthropomorphize our pets so much. You know, everybody does it. Of course they do. You talk to your pet all the time and you, as if you're having a conversation But I think the fact that Rosie was a rescue dog and she had certain behavioral issues as well, that I would get so frustrated and I would think, why can't I just explain to her 
just don't do that. Don't bark at this other dog because it's not a threat to you. But of course you can't because it's, it's an animal. And for all you might feel like an animal is a part of your family and you can adore it so much, it's not a human. It's an animal. And so I think it was by having this dog and loving her so much, but still understanding that we can never really understand one another, no matter how much we love one another, just really helped me to to get across how North feels for her bear, because she feels the same for him. They love each other in the best way that they know how, but still, she's a person and he's a bear, so they can't really communicate in that way. Well, thank you, Kirsty. It's been so interesting speaking to you, and um, we'll definitely be looking out for your next novel and I'm sure our listeners will go and check out Woman Turing. I've probably pronounced that wrong it's but we'll put, it. <laughs> it is, it is. we'll put a link to it on our on our Facebook page so that people can track it down if they want to but thank you so much for for giving up your time to talk oh, to us. Yeah thank you. Well, thank you. So now Kirsty if you wouldn't mind reading the second extract from The Grace Keepers. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to the other main character in the book who is called Kalanish and she is the grace keeper of the title and what that means is that she's something between a hermit and a grave keeper and she lays to rest the bodies of people who have died at sea and because the world is flooded instead of being buried they are sunk into the sea and above them is floated a cage with a bird in it and the bird is known as a grace. Um, so I'm just going to introduce you to a little bit of Kalanish. One evening, as Kalanish's fingers dipped towards the surface, she saw the supply boat approaching. She pulled on her gloves and rowed back to her house. Now she would not need seaweed or fish or the swallow of the sea over her head. She tried to be glad. She felt scooped out, hollow as a shell. She accepted the delivery without speaking. Her silence did not seem to matter, as the delivery man kept up a steady stream of words without leaving any gaps for a response, as he hauled cages of graces from the boat to the dock to the porch to the kitchen table. He spoke of trading routes and wheat shortages, of an abandoned ship found floating, perhaps empty for years, crewed only by cats of a baby born with gills and webbed hands, a half-fish monster buried alive at the world tree by its landlocker mother, and good riddance to the beast, of a new trend for tattooing the bases of one's fingernails purple, of a boy who had his hands cut off for chopping down a tree, of whispered scandals among military officers. Over the years, Kalanish had heard all these stories with small variations, Everything changed, and nothing changed. His chatter felt like having a record playing quietly, a soothing background hum. She sat at her table, her gloved hands pressed tight between her knees so he couldn't possibly see. She had received thousands of graces, delivered by dozens of different supply boats, and none had yet seen her hands. The government decreed that she should receive just as many graces as she needed to stay alive, but the exchange of restings for food was not the only thing keeping her alive. Wearing her gloves and slippers was just as important as eating. Given the choice, she would rather not be buried, still breathing, under the world tree. Writing Live. Now we want to thank you to Teresa, our editor, and Yvonne, the creator of the show.